He'll be talking about versatile computing on expanse, life sciences research, and he is the director of education at the center. Okay, Cindy, can you hear me okay? Is my audio all right? I <laughs> Sorry, Cindy, I was getting some feedback. Is, is the my audio good? Yes, Bob, you're good to go. Alrighty, excellent. Um, Cindy, should I start now? Okay. Then, um, then thank you, Cindy, for the for the introduction. I will kick things off. Uh, my name is Bob Sinkvitz. I'm the Director of Education and Training here at the San Diego Supercomputer Center. Sorry that I'm not able to be there in person this year, but I'm happy to be joining, joining you remotely. So I'm going to be giving a talk um, today on the life science research that's been accomplished using, using Expanse. And before I dive in, I do want to mention that Expanse is supported by the National Science Foundation. So. Although the talk is going to be primarily about the, about the applications, I do want to give you a little bit of background about Expanse and what it does. So the theme of Expanse is computing without boundaries, cyber infrastructure for the long tail of science. And what this means is that Expanse was really designed to support users with kind of small to medium-sized computational requirements. So we're not really meant for, for running the very, very largest jobs at scale. Um, but that said, even these small to medium jobs can be, um, can, can be reasonably large, um, involving hundreds to thousands of compute cores. So the expansion system was built um, in response to an NSF solicitation, Advanced Computing Systems and Services. Um, it is what we call a category one system, which means that it is a capacity, um, capacity resource, as opposed to category two, which are more experimental or novel resources. Program officer is Bob Chaddick. Um, PI and co-PIs, most of whom I believe are here in Dallas, is Mike Norman, Elke, Elkai Altintish, Amit Majumdar, Mahidar Tatanani, and Sean Strandy. The um, system was funded with $10 million for the acquisition and then another $2.5 million per year over the course of five years for the operations and maintenance. Um, multiple vendors were involved. Primary, the primary vendors, though, were Dell, um, who was our integrator for, for building the HPC system and EM computing for the storage. And be sure, if you have a chance, to visit both of your booths while you're here in Dallas. And then the compute, the interconnect, the NVMe, this was provided by AMD, Intel, NVIDIA, and Mellon others. So as I mentioned, our theme is computing, computing without boundaries. We think of Expanse as being both an HPC and a data-centric resource. Peak performance is about, is about five petaflops. Expanse has a unique design. It's built from what we call scalable units. There are 13 of these. Um, all total, they add up to 728 standard compute nodes, 52 GPU nodes, and four large memory nodes. It's also a data-centric architecture. It's backed up with 12 petabytes of performance storage. That's a luster parallel file system with a uh, maximum bandwidth of 140 gigabytes per second and 200,000 IOPS. We have fast local NVMe storage on every node. We're also deploying a seven petabyte Ceph object storage and we are connected to high performance research and engineering networks. Um, for the long tail of science, we're targeting many, many applications. A few that we had highlighted in, the, in our proposal was 
multi-messenger astronomy, genomics, earth sciences, and social sciences. And Expanse also has some innovative um, features. I'm gonna be talking about a few of those today, including the composable systems and science gateways, but it also supports high throughput computing, interactive computing, primarily Jupyter notebooks, containerized computing, and cloud bursting. So Expanse is a heterogeneous resource, and it's really designed for high performance, for reliability, for flexibility, and productivity. I'm not going to go through all of the speeds and feeds on this chart, but the one point that I do want to emphasize is the unique architecture built on these scalable compute units. And if you look at the figure, kind of um, just a little bit to the right of the large text box, you will see one of those scalable compute units. Within the unit, we have complete non-blocking, not non-blocking um, interconnect, 56 CPU nodes, each of those with 256 um, AMD Epic cores and four GPUs. So this design allows us to easily um, grow expense if we, if we need to. And in fact, we had done that already with the addition of one scalable unit to support our industry users. Um, when we look at how Expanse is being used, we like to break it down kind of into large bins um, by the NSF directorate of the, of the type of research. So I should, I should emphasize that Expanse users are not all NSF funded. Some of them come with no funding. Many are NIH funded. Some have um, NASA, DOE, um, USDA, and other, fund, other sources of funding. Um, but during the allocation process, the users are asked to specify which field of science that their work falls in. And the big takeaway from this slide is that it's really very balanced usage. So on the CPU side, we, we find that the mathematical and physical sciences, that's the very um, large blue blue wedge, um, almost 50%, you know, kind of is, the, is the largest user. Um, ge geosciences and engineering also account for, for much of the usage. By biological sciences is about a quarter. Um, on the GPU side, though, we see that the, that the biological and life sciences really dominate. It's close to um, about 70% of the GPU usage is for the biological sciences, and that's being driven by a few killer apps, mostly molecular dynamics, which is workhorse of molecular biology, where we can integrate Newton's equations of motion, follow the motion of individual atoms over the course of the simulation. Um, another, another big user, of course, is the construction of phylogenetic trees, um, primarily through the Cypress gateway that I'll be talking about shortly, um, and a few other genomics applications. So with that, I'm going to jump into a few of the, um, a few of the specifics of the um, life science research that's being done on Expanse. And I'm going to start with a few of our science gateways. So if you're not familiar with gateways, you could think of them as essentially being web interfaces to advanced cyber infrastructure. We realize that for many of their users, for many of our users, computation is not primarily what they do. They may be doing experimental work. They may be doing clinical work. And they need some very, very specific computation to support their research. And the Cypress phylogenetic gateway, I think, is a perfect example of this. Most of the users of, the, of this gateway come, come from backgrounds like environmental science and, and ecology. You know, I like to say that the ecologists are really spending most of their time doing field work. They might be collecting mushrooms and insects and, um, and, and, and fish and taking blood samples and so on. And to them, constructing phylogenetic trees is just one of the tools that they need to use as part of their, um, part, uh, part of their total research pipeline. So Expanse has had a really, really big impact for many years here, here at SCSC. It was used on our previous systems, Gordon and um, Gordon and Comet, and now it's um, used very heavily on Expanse. So far, we've supported more than 10,000 users in nearly 80 countries. Um, they've run over 150,000 jobs. They typically use close to 10 million core hours per year, along with tens of thousands of hours of GPU time. Um, this is a, this has resulted in thousands of peer-reviewed publications. Um, in 2021 alone, 
there were about 13 publications. I believe that the total count is now somewhere close to 10,000. Um, this has had a big impact um, both during the, during the pandemic and the analysis of SARS-CoV-2 sequences, but also more broadly, the discovery of more than a thousand new species, new genera, new family, and new biological order. So the gateway can have a really, really big impact sometimes using a relatively small amount of compute time. And I'm just highlighting a few examples here. Um, in the upper left is work that was published in Science, um, looking at the um, evolutionary um, relationships between species of species of cobra. Um, the upper right, um, study study the dire wolves. So this is a, um, a, a now extinct wolf species. Um, it's had an impact on on on, um, uh, on understanding flu, flu pandemics and also on the uh, on the COVID pandemic. Another gateway that's had a really big impact is the neuroscience gateway. So since, um, since, since the beginning or close to the beginning of 2021, the Neuroscience Gateway has used about 6 million core hours um, on, on Comet, um, also on Comet and Stampede, but primarily on, on Expanse, has more than 1,000 registered users from across the world. And the Neuroscience Gateway provides a, a really easy interface to, to using many of the tools that are used by neuroscientists um, in, in a number of different domains. Um, one that I do wanna, wanna highlight is something called the NEMAR project. This is part of the, of the BRAIN initiative, and this is to analyze neuroelectromagnetic data. And NSG is funded by grants from the National Science Foundation and National Institutes of Health. So, you know, what one, one tool that I do wanna point out what one component of the Neuroscience Gateway is that it is now the execution engine for this NEMAR project. And this allows researchers to do really in-depth analysis and visualization of EEG and MEG and other types of, types of brain scanning data. Um, recently, researchers were able to process 30 very large EEG data sets on, on Expanse using the EEG, EEG lab software. So this is a really important resource for, for the neuroscience community. And then one more gateway I'm gonna highlight is the ITASL gateway. So this is for protein structure prediction. So this is work done by the, by the Zhang group at University of Michigan. So they had been users on Comet and they made a very easy transition to, um, to, to, to Expanse. In the CASP 14 competition, so this is the protein structure um, prediction, that they were the top server for automated protein structure um, prediction. Of course, there are, there are new techniques now for, for doing protein structure prediction, AlphaFold and AlphaFold2, but ICAST still plays a um, impl really important role for this community. And I should also point out that the Zhang Lab, in addition to providing this community resource, which leverages expense. They also, um, they're very, also very active in their own research. So this was at the beginning of the COVID-19 pandemic that they had immediately modeled all the 3D structures and functions of the SARS-CoV-2 protein before these had been solved experimentally. So these results were widely used by the community report then the work was reported by nearly 100 new sources had over 50,000 views. So it had a very quick and important impact on, on the COVID research. So with that, I'm going to switch gears, talk about some of the work that's being done by individual labs. I'm gonna start off with, uh, with, with research by Jeff Wozinski's lab at the Illinois Institute of Technology. So he's been using Expanse to study epigenetics at the molecular level. So I think most of us are familiar with genetics or genomics, you know, where our, um, where, where, where our genome is encoded in a series of a series of bases, A, C's, G's, and T's. But there's also something called epigenetics, which involves heritable modifications to the, N, to, to the DNA, with, which affect the expression of genes. And the two primary mechanisms are methylation of the DNA and also 
at acetylation of the histone. So these are protein cores that the DNA will wrap around. So, so once the DNA is condensed, it cannot be, it's not accessible to, um, to, to the transcription machinery. Um, where, whereas when it's unraveled, when it's not wound around the nucleosomes, um, it, it is accessible. So um, Rosinski's lab, Rosinski lab's work has been focusing on the um, histone acetylation and the interaction of the DNA with these nucleosome cores. So, you know, important, very fundamental research that tunes how these, how these genes are expressed. Um, returning to, um, re returning to the, to the pandemic, we work on membrane, pre membrane peptides in SARS-CoV-2. This is work being done by Jeffrey Clauda at the University of Maryland. And he was investigating a very, very specific problem. He found that when one of the SARS-CoV-2 pro, SARS proteins named ORF7A would, interfact and would interact with human bone marrow stromal cell antigen 2, or BST2, that it, that it lowers the immune response and actually increases the vir virulence of the, uh, of, of, the, of the virus. So he used expanse to compare wild type BST2 with naturally occurring mutations to see if this genetic diversity might influence the dimerization of BST2 and therefore the severity of the infection. So again, very, very targeted work related to the pandemic. Next, I'm gonna talk a little bit about work being done at University of Utah. So this was Jessica Swanson and, and Jay Braun, and they've been using Expanse to simulate liquid, sorry, lipid droplets um, with high with, with, with high sterile ester concentrations. So these were very long all atom molecular dynamics simulations, and they were able to capture the phase transition before it was discovered experimentally using cryo-electron microscopy. And this plays a role in the formation of foam cells that can lead to atherosclerosis. If you're not familiar with the um, term atherosclerosis, is also you know, more and more um, colloquially known as hardening the arteries. It's something that most of us are gonna face as, as we age. So really important work. You can look over here in these two figures near, near the left of the slide. Um, they're showing the simulation at 10 nanoseconds and later at eight microseconds, which is a very, very long molecular dynamic simulation, which requires resources such as expanse. Um, they were able to, you know, also look at the um, how this phase transition led, led to changes in packing, in packing defects, and then finally altering the protein association. So in, important work in a you know in a disease that's going to you know affect many many of us. Um, pivoting to some work being done by Francesco Paisani here at University of California, San Diego. So Francesco's lab is incredibly prolific. They work in many different areas. Um, but more recently, they've been using Expanse to study and understand base editors. So these are a novel class of, um, class of enzymes that, that can be used to, um, to, to make base pair repairs at the genome level. So you've probably been following the, following the science news. Um, there's been a lot of talk about CRISPR over the years, where we could use CRISPR to, to edit genes. And that's working on a much higher level. It is snipping out genes, um, making insertions. But here, we're actually going in and doing very, very targeted repairs. So we're making changes to single bases. So not all, but a number of um, re relatively common diseases are driven by these point mutations. So I'm gonna say the, the most common one is probably sickle cell anemia, which affects, um, which affects many people of, of African descent. Um, another um, the disease that could, be, that could be targeted with this work is, is, is Tay-Sachs disease, which affects primarily Ashkenazi, Ashkenazi Jews. And finally, beta thalassemia, which is another, um, uh, another rare blood disease. So th this work can have a really, really important impact on some of these truly, debil de 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 sorry, truly debilitating diseases. 
I'm now going to talk about some work being done at the University of Illinois. This is by the Aximentia lab, and they've been using expanse to um, study the mechanisms of charge transport through proteins. What I like about this work is that it complements experimental studies that, me that measure electric current through proteins to identify conformational changes. And what's really important about this work is that it may give us a path toward faster and cheaper DNA and protein sequencing. So these calculation and calculations involved a couple of techniques. So first they did, again, all atom molecular dynamic simulations to um, calculate the rates of electron transfer between all pairs of electri electrically, active electrically active residues within the proteins. Then the total current is computed using a different technique called kinetic Monte Carlo. And what was shown here in the figure on the right is that the simulations are in good agreement with the, with, with, the experiment, with the experimental measurements of the current through the proteins. Okay, now I'm gonna highlight some work being done by Oliver Beckstein's lab at Arizona State University. So he's been studying membrane proteins, primarily ion channels and transporters, again, using all atom molecular dynamics simulation. And you'll notice that there's a theme here that many of these researchers are using, are using MD or molecular dynamics, which accounts for much of the usage of our GPUs. And this is really, really important work for a number of, for, for a number of diseases that are associated with faulty, faulty ion channels. And these include cystic fibrosis and muscular dystrophy and certain cardiovascular diseases. So again, really, really important work studying a, studying a large class of proteins that do have big implications for human health. So earlier I talked about the, talked about the Cypress Gateway and how it's used by, by a wide community of ecologists, and environmental scientists. But we also have researchers who are constructing phylogenetic trees outside of, outside of the gateway. So in this case, it was um, work by Siavash Mirarab at UCSD, UC San Diego. And he was doing calculations that I think needed a little bit more hands-on work um, that, that couldn't necessarily be run through the gateway. And he's been doing some really amazing groundbreaking work in, in phylogenetics. So we're highlighting two, two, two of his projects here. On the left, he, he inferred a new tree of life for, for more than 300 bird species. Um, when we say that 2000 trees were inferred, this is a um, stochastic process as, as we infer these trees. So many, many trees are inferred, but we're ultimately looking for an agreement between those trees. Um, and this was based on more than 150,000 genomic regions. This part of the workload was, ex was executed on the Expanse GPU. Now he also did, um, did, did work kind of at the other end of the spectrum. And this was on constructing phylogenetic trees for microbial species. So I know this is kind of hard to read here, but what you're looking at is a tree of 600,000 microbial species based on 380 different genes. And I believe that he um, constructed entirely new regions of the uh, of microbial tree of life. And then just a couple more examples. Um, this is wild, wildfire modeling work that took advantage of composable systems. So I mentioned this briefly in the, in the beginning of my talk when I was discussing the novel features of expanse. And one of them is composable system. So this is where we combine resources from expanse with external resources this, to solve really complex heterogeneous problems. And this was first demonstrated using a fire modeling scenario. And I'm just going to um, give a call, I, call out to Elkai Altintish who will be talking about this tomorrow, I believe at 11 o'clock. So this is really fascinating work. You know, involves taking, da taking data from real-time sensors, weather forecasts, um, observations from, from drones, satellites, and helicopters of the, of the fire perimeter, 
it incorporates landscape analysis and so on. This is all driven by a Kepler workflow system. And as I mentioned, again, takes advantage of, of expanse and other resources to model the progression of wildfires. And then one last example I wanna highlight, um, this, this is, I wouldn't really consider this to be, to be life sciences, but it didn't quite fit in the other talk either. Um, this was digital, um, the digital music composition, work being done by, by Sever Tippe at the University of Illinois. And this is work he's been doing for, for quite some time on, on San Diego resources, where he's implemented an interactive streaming version of his disco tool on Expanse. So this runs Jupyter Notebooks that can play sounds in near, near real time. And by using this system on Expanse, he was able to do some really, really complex digital musical, digital music composition that would just been impossible to do manually. So I'm gonna wrap up, I'll take questions in just a few minutes, but I'd say the two takeaways um, from my talk is that first of all, Expanse has had a tremendous impact on research in the biological sciences. And this has been across a wide range of domains, neuroscience, molecular biology, genetics, phylogenetics. SCSC also continues to be a leader in science gateways and it supported nearly 20 gateways in Expanse, including three of the most successful ever deployed on Exceed or Access resources, Cypress, NSG, and ITESER. And sorry, before I take questions, just a few things to wrap up. I do wanna thank all of our collaborators, our partners, users, and the SDSC team. Um, if you have a chance, please go, um, but please stop by the day in the Dell, AMD, Eon, Intel, Mellanox, and, and, and other booths. Um, and, Oh, over on the left, you can see the um, but part of the team that, that really helped to make, make Expanse a, a success. And then finally, one last slide um, before I move on. I do want to make a pitch for the PERP 23 conference that's gonna be held in Portland, Oregon next July. Um, the call for participation is now open. Um, if you're unfamiliar with PERC, I encourage you to go and take a look. Um, it really focuses on the research computing community and has tracks for everything from, for, from applications to education and workforce development and systems development. And with that, I am happy to take any questions. Thank you so much, Bob. Do we have any questions in the audience? All right, Bob. Well, thank you so much. There's no questions in the audience. No questions in the chat as well. So. Thanks for your time. We'll Great, see you again thank tomorrow. You. Thank, thank you so much. <laughs> Take care, Bob. See you soon.